Welcome to China, the upcoming superpower that even after many decades of impressive economic growth is still home to a rapidly evolving economy. But what does China's economy actually look like today? And how has it dealt with COVID? We've all heard that it's the second largest in the world and that many think tanks and private companies forecast the Chinese economy to surpass the USA's by as early as 2028. But what does the situation inside of China look like? After all, this is a nation that is home to a population larger than that of the EU, Brazil, the USA, Japan, Australia, Colombia and Russia combined. If the USA has disparities between states such as New York and Mississippi, then to what extent are the disparities in China? But before we start, make sure to hit that like button, subscribe and share this video, and check out the channel support box below, where you can even pick up a free share, as we dive into the third and final part of our series on the Chinese economy. Welcome to Rebalancing China. So, I've decided to break down this video into two parts. The first part will look at how China has dealt with the pandemic, and the second will look at the internal imbalances that exist within China's economy and what's being done to address them. Okay, let's get started. So, China has managed to deal with the what seems like forever ongoing pandemic relatively well. And its economy has seen the benefits of the stricter policies that an authoritarian government can impose upon its people. After having been the first country in the world to witness a sharp decrease in production and consumption in the first quarter of 2020, many economists around the globe have been impressed by how quickly the Chinese economy has bounced back, with the nation still registering growth in 2020. But, despite the growth, China has seen imbalances accelerate within its economy, as a result of a variety of factors, including increases in household savings and increases in public and private debt. Now, balance sheets in the banking sector have become more vulnerable to any future economic shocks. However, recent events can be broken down by sector, because China's recovery was primarily driven by industrial production. This actually shouldn't be too much of a surprise, since as the rest of the world began to lock down, demand for medical equipment for hospitals and electronic goods for workers looking to begin their soul-destroying workdays from the comfort of their homes became reality. And China was, and still is, a major producer of these goods. However, despite the demand for these goods, a significant driver of this growth in the industrial sector was being driven by public sector infrastructure investments and real estate investment within China. Domestic consumption, on the other hand, was lagging, which saw unemployment increase, and households receive fewer incomes as a result of centres of economic consumption close due to the virus. But, much like the rest of the world, the bounce back that has taken place in the service sector also took place in China. But consumer behaviour has noticeably changed, with contact intensive sectors seeing a slower recovery. This change in the dynamics of growth in the Chinese economy has actually been in the opposite direction to what has been happening prior to the pandemic. And this links us to the direction in which the Chinese economy is heading today. The last decade has seen a large change take place in China. Its economy is becoming increasingly focused on its service sector. Just look at this graph. Since the early 1970s until the mid-2010s, industry made up more than 40% of China's GDP. But in the last 10 years, that figure has dropped almost 10 percentage points and shows no sign of slowing down. This isn't particularly a bad thing, and doesn't mean that Chinese industry is not growing. But what it does mean is that the motors of Chinese economic growth are changing. And you've probably noticed it wherever you are in the world today. How many of you were aware of Huawei, Tencent and Alibaba 10 years ago? And have you ever used TikTok or WeChat? These companies and services are a testament to China's shifting economic focus, and in many ways, it's been successful. 
But let's put the brakes on this idea that China's economy is just marching forward as it jumps over almost every obstacle that it encounters. Because that's not the reality. A transitioning economy results in winners and losers, not just outside of China, but also within. To start with some context, let's just take a quick look at GDP per capita across China's massive provinces. The first thing to point out is that rich China is in the east and poor China is in the west. China's richest provinces like Beijing, Shanghai and Jiangsu have a similar level of economic prosperity as some of the poorer members of the EU. Think Latvia and Portugal. Whereas the poorest provinces are more in line with Peru and Belarus. These are provinces that are far from the flashy cities that you may have in your head about China. So what's the problem then? Don't all countries have significant economic divisions? Just think South and North Brazil, North and South Italy, or mega city centric economies like Paris in France or London in England. Well, the problem for China is that its evolving economy may make the lagging provinces in the West more costly to policymakers in Beijing. You see, much of China's Western provinces rely a lot more on government investment than the East. But despite there also being a lot of private investment, which has arrived in Western China thanks to market forces and the state marketing its Western development strategy in the mid 2000s, there's a legitimate concern that this investment driven convergence with Eastern China won't continue as China moves away from being the world's factory of cheap goods, as the only wages low enough to support such cheap goods are becoming increasingly found only in China's western provinces. This is in addition to the fact that investments have diminishing returns. China's government has drastically improved the infrastructure in its western provinces. But once the railroads, schools, highways and internet cables are built, the returns on any further investments are not as noticeable in economic metrics, at least not in a good way. Interprovincial and interregional investment has increased throughout the last 20 years in China. But with a diminishing return on investments and a government that is also pumping money into the region for political reasons, many of the companies and institutions in the West have found themselves in a mountain of debt, which is expected to lower economic growth prospects and cause a period of divergence between China's East and China's West in the coming decades. And with the East beginning to feel the impact of a rapidly aging society, it wouldn't be absurd to just ask how Beijing plans to finance the continued convergence between its West and East to ensure mutual prosperity for the whole of China. Hi everyone, I hope you enjoyed the final video I am doing as part of this series on China. If you want to support the channel, then hit that like button, subscribe or write a comment for the algorithm. Just type pineapple, I'd really appreciate it. Also, there's a channel support box below if you want to check it out. And if you've made it this far, let me know how you think China's economy will do in the coming decades. Are you a optimist or a pessimist? Anyway, I'll catch you all in the next one. Take care. Bye.